teams before kickoff to delivering career-ending hits, a special group of players have kept opponents up at Damn. night with their terrorizing behavior. These are the 10 scariest players in NFL history. No other player had a more iconic way of instilling fear in the eyes of his opponents than Ray Lewis. And he did it before the game even started. His pregame entrance was a declaration what the of war. What the hell? From a guy who said that every time he stepped on the field, he was Maximus from Gladiator. As Lewis would emerge from a smoky tunnel with fire blazing all around him before partaking in something that looked like a scene from his favorite movie, opposing teams shut This guy ain't there to play American football. He's there to break some knees. Don't mess with me, boy. Get up. You said something about my mama? <laughs> what about you my say mama? about my mama? What's the blue? We on this hell today. We're not, we're the blue. We're on because on they knew what was coming. 60 minutes of bone-crushing hits from Oof. number 52. Sports Science said the only reason he didn't break his opponent's bones on every hit is because the shoulder pads absorbed 50% of the force. Lock Lewis it was up. so powerful that he didn't even have to be locked in on a player to lay them out. Having shared a division with him for many years, former Bengals wide receiver Chad Ochocinco decided that he had finally had enough of Lewis's reign of terror. Oh. While Lewis had his eyes on the ball, Ochocinco tried tried to get payback for countless brutal hits with a blindside shot on the linebacker. Yet, despite paying no attention to Ocho Cinco, Lewis leveled him to the ground. All right, that's sad. He's like, I'm going to take him out, yeah? He got, he bounced he off the bullied. guy. He tackled him and he bounced off and just like broke a bone in the process. Yeah. Like it was nothing and left the wide out gasping for air. Damn. Rudy's coming. He's winded. I tried to blindside Ray. He ran me over. <laughs> Consider it a lesson to never test one of the most vicious to ever do it. He wasn't looking and still ran through me. And unfortunately, the concussion set in. Concussion. I tried to pretend like nothing happened. Along Duh. with making every hit count, it wasn't just quality over quantity for Lewis. To this day, he is still the NFL's all-time leader in career solo and combined tackles with 1,568 and 2,059. Having a this is war mentality is definitely something that the terrorizing Jack Tatum could relate to, but there was nothing even remotely close to civilized about his play. Oh. Tatum developed a reputation for being absolutely ruthless with his hits, and sometimes even crossing the line. Because of this, he became known as the assassin, and for good reason. <laughs> Fiercest hitter at safety ever, <laughs> and Jack Tatum, aforementioned by me. Oh, Fiercest hitter in the game. They call him the assassin. Yep, the assassin. During a 1978 preseason game on an incomplete pass over the middle, he paralyzed Patriots wide receiver Daryl Stingley from the chest down. Not only were people oh, furious that Tatum paralyzed sad. another player, they couldn't believe it happened during a meaningless preseason game. And to make matters worse, Tatum never apologized for the hit. Uh, I'm guessing that's the guy's career over, and that's preseason. Preseason is like friendly games, it's not even competitive. It's like oh just warming up to like the serious games. He didn't even say sorry. So yeah, you just, just don't care. Yeah, you it, man. That's, that's, that's it, crazy, man. poor guy. I just like to you know wish Daryl you know a full speedy recovery and uh, send him my best wishes. And even went as far as saying this: I understand why Daryl is considered the victim, but I'll never understand why some people look at me as the villain. While this response may come as a bit of a shock, Tatum's idea of a good hit sheds some light on his approach to the game. My idea of a good hit is when the victim wakes up on the sideline, train whistles blowing in his head. What the? I like hell? to believe that my best hits border on felonious assault. Despite public blowback, Tatum refused to change his hard-hitting ways. A year after it, he was face-to-face -face with one of the game's most powerful running backs in Earl Campbell. Tatum met him head-on at the goal line, and even though Campbell managed to stumble into the end zone, the collision left a lasting impact. The lick I took from Jack Tatum, that's the only time I ever felt somebody hit me, Campbell said. A shock went down to the heels of my feet, and it burned. When I was what? standing on my head in my end zone, nobody knew this, but I was thinking, something's wrong. A year later, one of Campbell's doctors watched the collision and believed it caused him spinal problems that plagued him uh, long after his career was over. These hits are serious. So his whole body was ringing. So something probably cracked or chipped or in the spine. That's so sad, man. But the guy, obviously his tackles are hard, but it's the sport. But what's mad is he knows how dang his dangerous his but tackles yeah, he are. Continues. He continues, but... He, he needs to tackle hard. If you don't tackle hard, these guys ain't going down. Yeah, it's true. Like, and that's probably why he's thinking, why are you looking at me as a villain? Because that is my job. He's doing his job, yeah. yeah. 
Tatum's hits will live forever in infamy. But they're still not the most famous hits in NFL history. That distinction belongs to arguably the greatest defensive player ever, Lawrence Taylor. With the football world tuned into a 1985 Monday night football game between the Giants and Redskins, Taylor, on a single play, changed the sport forever. As Washington ran a flea flicker, Taylor saw right through the trickery and pounced on QB Joe Theismann Good like job. a jungle cat. Taylor and a handful of players immediately signaled to the sideline for help, as Theismann was in excruciating pain and unable to get up. Having broken both bones in his lower leg, Theismann Whoa, never played another snap. Because of that play and Taylor's overall dominance at the position, cool. teams at all levels began placing on emphasis on the left tackle position to protect the quarterback's blindside. Although the play ultimately defined his career, Taylor's accolades should be just as memorable. As the iconic John Madden put it, he changed the way defense is played. The way pass rushing is played, the way linebackers play, and the way offenses block linebackers. As a 10-time Pro Bowler, Taylor became just the second defender to win the league's MVP award. He was also named Defensive Player of the Year three times. Nice. Legendary Master. coach Bill Belichick served as Taylor's defensive coordinator with the Giants and said, What makes LT so great, what makes him so aggressive, is his total disregard for his body. Belichick even went as far as to declare him he just doesn't care about the damage on himself. He just throws himself and whatever happens, happens. Yep. The best defensive player he's ever coached by a good margin. And while Taylor had no intentions of ending Theismann's career, the same cannot be said for when Hall oh. of Fame linebacker Dick Butkus was out there. According to fellow Hall of Famer Deacon Jones, He was an animal and he was a well-conditioned animal and every time he hit you, he tried to put you in the cemetery, not the hospital. This savage playing style and mindset came from Buckus's unique warm-up routine. When I went out on the field to warm up, I would manufacture things to make me mad. He said, <laughs> if someone on the other team was laughing, I'd pretend he was laughing at me or the Bears. I'd find something to get mad about. It you know what? That's a Making up stories in his own yeah. head. What? A what do you say about my mama? What? Is he laughing at me? He's laughing at my mama. <laughs> no one laughs at my mama. Oh my God always worked for him. But opposing players were <laughs> definitely never laughing at Butkus, because in reality, they were deathly afraid of him. You know what? You guys obviously know. Have you watched Waterboy before? I think so. I, I, I think it's Adam Sandler. Uh, it's an actor, um, one of the favorite, the guy from, uh, I think he's in, he's in so many movies. Guys, If I know a lot of you have watched Waterboy. It's, it's a movie on American football, and the guy basically was the Waterboy, but he gets promoted to a player. And what his training was he'll pretend they're cussing him so when that like, he'll come onto the pitch he was only good when he's angry when he's not angry he's like some weird fragile he doesn't know what he's doing so um the coach told him you need to start pretending and thinking of things that make you angry and the one thing that made him the most angry sat about his mama but he used to pretend like they're saying stuff. He'll start talking to the player and the player's like, what the hell? Like, you're, you're right. right. Like, yeah. 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 We need to watch that. We should react to that. Guys, if you want us to react to Waterboy, comment below. Yeah. Oh, me was going to kick my... You know what? <laughs> the first time I ever played against him a rookie year. As former Packers running back MacArthur Lane once put it, if I had a choice, I'd sooner go one-on-one -on -one with a grizzly bear than with Butkus. Damn. I prayed that I could get up every time Butkus hit me. In addition to laying the boom on guys like Lane, Butkus led one of the NFL's all-time greatest defenses and tackles for eight straight seasons. Jack eight Lambert seasons. was another linebacker in charge of one of the league's most terrorizing defenses ever, serving as the face of the Steel Curtain. And it was an unforgettable face, to say the least. Missing his four upper front teeth, Lambert's oh toothless snarl was the perfect representation of his playing style. Before like becoming Uzik. a legend, John Elway in his first career game had to go up against Lambert's Steelers. It was a moment that Elway would never forget, and one he couldn't wait to end. He had no teeth and he was slobbering all over himself, Elway oh. said. I'm thinking, you can have your money back, just get me out of here. I can't tell you how badly I wanted out of there. Nicknamed Dracula in Cleats, Lambert Lambert's motto was, we're the Pittsburgh Steelers. We're supposed to be the Intimidators. He did everything he could to live up to this, even Duh. if it meant almost getting thrown out of the Super Bowl. In Super Bowl X, Cowboys safety Cliff Harris taunted Steelers kicker Roy Jarella by patting him on the head following a missed field goal. Lambert responded immediately by body-slamming Harris to the ground. 
After the game, he explained the move by saying, When I see injustice, I try to do something about it. Lambert never shied away from confrontation and always had his teammates' backs. His Bro. bold attitude and fearless play inspired teammates and propelled them to four Super Bowl victories in just six seasons. Wow. Being on his team, you know you got someone to back you. Like, you can yeah. do whatever and this guy's got your back. He'll die for his team. Excuse me, sir, he pushed me. <laughs> <laughs> and with just as cool a nickname as Dracula in cleats, Dick Night Train Lane was never supposed to make this Dick Lane. <laughs> What a name that is. Wow. <laughs> Let alone play in the NFL. Lane played just one season of junior college football before serving in the U.S. Army for four years. After being discharged from the Army, he happened to pass by the Los Angeles Rams office on his bus ride to work. Despite a total lack of experience playing the sport at a high level, Lane decided to stop in and asked to try out as a receiver. The team was so blown away by his raw athleticism that they gave him a spot. Lane wow. Is that military training? No, no, yeah. We know all about military training. We've got reactions to it. They don't mess around so eventually switched to defensive back and the Rams quickly fell in love with his ferocious playing style it didn't take long for the rest of the league Ooh. to become familiar with this as the NFL had to create rules against Lane's brutal tackling style he became known for wrapping players around the neck or grabbing their face mask and slinging them to the ground people started calling the move the night train necktie. In 1961, he tackled John Arnett by the face mask while he was running at full speed and left him lying motionless on the field. The next year, the NFL made a rule prohibiting grabbing the face mask to make a tackle. They later banned a tackle around the head and neck, or what was called a clothesline tackle, yeah. largely because of night train. For Lane, there was no That's malicious nuts. intent with it, explaining, my object is to stop the guy before he gains another inch. I'm usually dealing with ends who are trying to catch passes, and if I hit them in the legs, they may fall forward for a first down. There's nothing I hate worse than a first down. In addition to wreaking havoc with his tackling style, Lane was also a menace as a ball hawk. To this day, he still holds the NFL record for most interceptions in a season with 14, somehow nice. doing so in only 12 games. Wow. But Lane That's isn't impressive. the only player on this list who also finds himself all over the NFL record book. And while most people associate scary football players with defenders, this guy actually played on the other side of the ball. Throughout his career, Jim Brown made sure that the opposing team always saw him in the warm-ups. He said, Knowing that they'd been told all about me all week, and how they'd have to watch out for me, and how they'd have to plan to stop <laughs> me and gang tackle me, I challenged them by saying, This is the guy, man. Take a look. Here it is, right now. 232 pounds, 6 foot 2 inches. I can beat you in a 40, and I got attitude. The attitude is, you're going to hit me, and I'm going to hit you. Feisty. What could be mistaken for an arrogant mindset by Brown was a well-earned, confident swagger. He knew that he was nearly impossible to bring down Good as balance. he led the league in rushing in eight wow. out of his nine seasons. Unfortunately for Brown's opponents, this unbelievable feat wasn't just the result of him just outrunning them. Saying that he viewed football as the closest, civilized he thing to up. war, Brown Ten would guys often on bulldoze his opponents. His famous line was, make sure when anyone tackles you, he remembers how much it hurts, and his opponents sure did remember it. As Brown set the all-time record for most career rushing yards with 12,312, yards per carry with 5.2, and rushing touchdowns with 106. It's been more than 50 years since he retired, and his record of career rushing yards per game still stands at 100. 50 years later, your record's still there, and you're like no, certainly pro so after Oh that. my god, he was just, he was just budging them like, like they were little ants or something. No. Ew, like a boulder. Me. Yeah, <laughs> Not only has it stood the test of time, but no other player has even cracked the 100 yards per game mark since. The hell? And while Brown was always a superstar on the gridiron, James Harrison's journey to making this list is a true underdog story. Undersized at only six feet tall, Harrison was released three different times as a rookie, but instead of giving up on his dream, he used those setbacks as inspiration and fuel to become one of the strongest and most durable players the game has ever seen. It also led Harrison to never taking his foot off the gas nice. on the field. My objective when tackling someone was to put them out of that game. I didn't want to injure them. But I wanted him to hurt. Even if he was going up against a close friend. In the same 2010 game against the Browns, Harrison knocked out two different Cleveland wide receivers, oh, in Josh Cribbs and Muhammad Masakoy. Describing his approach, Harrison explained, I tried to hurt people. I never tried to injure anyone. I tried to hurt people. I wanted them not to be able to finish the game. When I hit my homeboy Josh Cripps, I felt like when I hit him, that hurt. I want to be able to say, I got you. Then, while the thing is, it's hard to get the right balance of hurting them but not injuring them. How do you get that fine line? These are big people you're up against. You need to hit hard. 
I mean, considering the previous players that we've watched, they didn't care. They didn't care. Like they're out here trying to kill people. But I feel like this guy's probably just saying it to not be the villain. Maybe he's hitting hard as he can. I think yeah. man. he's not. I don't think he's holding back. Talking years later about the hit on Masakoi, he said, Look at that. I hit Masakoi with about 50%, bro. Dead nah, serious. I just wanted him to let go of the ball. If I would have known then what I found out after, I'd have gave him everything I had. If I'd known they was going to fine me $75,000 for oh that, I would have laid into him. He might not have gotten off that field. As Harrison got older, neither his viciousness nor his otherworldly strength faded. While most defenders don't play past 39, he was still lighting up opposing wide receivers and going viral for his workout videos. A workout video from 2017 showed him doing 675-pound hip thrusts, wow. hang cleans, and reverse lunges at 315, 405-pound decline presses, 225-pound oh overhead triceps extensions, and 1,800-pound sled pushes. This is why he's knocking guys out, because he is a machine in the gym, and obviously all this NFL stuff. It's crazy. Another player who used superhuman strength to become a total nightmare for opposing teams was Reggie White. As former Eagles wide receiver Mike Quick put it, he could take a 320 pound man and just toss him like it was nothing. <laughs> the funniest thing is to see a 320 pound man just being tossed. And I've never seen anything <laughs> like that. And not only did White have this freakish strength, but he had speed and athleticism that allowed him to play defensive end while moving like a linebacker. Herm Edwards, who played with White on the Eagles said, I'd never seen anyone that big and that strong who could move that fast. He was so explosive. He drove blockers back like they were on roller skates. This extremely rare combination of speed and strength made him essentially unblockable as he retired as the league's all-time sack leader with 198. According to former Eagles linebacker Gary Cobb, he never saw the kind of fear in the eyes of a lineman the way they used to be afraid of blocking Reggie. <laughs> Similar to White, the final player on this list also relied on a unique combo of speed and strength. But standing at 5'11 and weighing 244 pounds, Earl Campbell shouldn't have been able to do what he did. Being that thick and condensed, it was no surprise that he could and would often run defenders over, punishing them with his aggressive play. But the wow. crazy thing about him was that he was just as fast as he was strong. People his size aren't supposed to have 4'6", 40-yard dash times. Campbell ran angry out there, and with his massive 36 inch thighs, he never went down without a fight. The team's equipment manager joked that they made four sizes of thigh pads small, medium, <laughs> large, and Earl Campbell. No <laughs> moment shows just how powerful Campbell I was it. in a play from when he was only a rookie. He met Rams all pro linebacker Isaiah Robinson in the hole with a head on collision that Ooh. left the defender flat on his back. He done the Zinedine Zidane. If you guys know about what happened in the, in the Zin uh, Zinedine Zidane headbutt, he literally just Bam in his chest and yeah. he got winded. Yeah. But with a helmet as well, that's even worse. Mm. Campbell then shredded another tackler who held on for dear life and was left with nothing but a piece of his jersey as Campbell kept charging forward. He was a human wrecking ball. He's a monster. There, just demolishing opposing defenders. Legendary Steelers linebacker Joe Green claims that Campbell could inflict more damage than any other running back he's ever faced. Former Cowboys safety Cliff Harris agreed, saying, when you finished a game against Earl, you had to sit in a tub with Epsom salts. And despite constantly using his body to deliver beatings Nuts. to a opposing players, Campbell, throughout his career, only missed six games due to an injury, a testament to his next level toughness. There was a lot of beasts in that video. Scary? Super scary. Very motivational. When I go to the gym next time, I'm going to go, ah! <laughs> <laughs> you ain't competing in the like NFL. Them. Hip thrust 600 pounds as well. <laughs> Dude, that's mad. How much you hip thrust? 200 kg. What's that? I don't pounds? know what it is in pounds, but you know. 200 kg in pounds. For four reps. Four reps. I'd say it's very strong. Obviously, yeah. these are professional athletes and different. These are men, so you know I'm doing well. But yeah, guys, thanks so much for the recommendation. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Comment below if you're impressed by 200 pounds hip thrust by fats. For now, peace out. Bye.